Okay, we, I wanted to start the recording um, so that those who, <laughs> through my malfeasance, couldn't get on the call today will have a chance to listen to it later if they want to. So Kathy, you had a question. Um, you know, there's a lot about this Christmas mystery that we could discuss today that uh, I'll try to link in to whatever your question is. So, you know, we, we used to have this, we used to have this exercise in grade school, the, the, I think it was sixth or seventh grade, the nun would come by and she would draw a, a line of some sort, some squiggly line on your paper and you were supposed to make an art project out of it. <laughs> and I was real good at that. I, no matter what they scribbled on my page, I, I mean, I wasn't a good artist, but I was happy to uh, play around with whatever they threw out there. So um, I, I, you know, maybe this gathering's a little bit like the food channel, you know, where they give you the mystery ingredient and they say, okay, now make something out of avocados, you know, <laughs> and we got to have five dishes by the end of the hour. So that's, <laughs> I guess that's kind of what we're doing on this gathering. You throw out a question and I'll try to make five dishes out of it. Okay, uh, last Sunday was the Feast of the Holy Family. And of course, uh, Simeon talked about the sword, you know, that would pierce uh, Mary's heart. When I was doing my journaling about it, for some reason, my mind went to the crucifixion. Uh huh. And well, it was, we all know water has been very important in the uh, Old Testament, New Testament. When they pierced, you know, Christ's side, blood and water came out. I understand the the blood was redemption and after a lot of researching i found they're saying the water uh was importing life this was just one person is the water actually signifying eternal life it just took me in all different directions well if it, if it was do you like the idea yes yeah. <laughs> Good. Then, Good then, then that's exactly what it signifies. <laughs> Good hey, I'm going to put everybody on mute. Kathy's asked her question. You can certainly follow up with that, Kathy. If you want to uh, share in this sharing, just unmute yourself, but I'll just do it for the sake of, of quiet here. So I'm going to put everybody on mute, but you can unmute yourself at any time. Um, boy, that's a... You, you couldn't really, you, you know, I wanted to talk about, um, about uh, uh, the nativity and, and um, the, the Holy Family readings in particular. Um, let me close this for a second here. There we are. Close. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Um, so yes, yeah, so so Simeon says to Mary, your own. So, so she, it's really funny that that we have the feast of the Holy Family. I, I I think this irony probably was lost on most congregations over the weekend, but not at the one on Saint Andrews. I hope because I tried to show the incongruity of having the feast on of the Holy Family on the very day that they highlight a gospel that shows that Jesus came to destroy the family. <laughs> and by that, I mean, so, so it starts right here in the presentation. You get this nice little scene of three people coming to do the, the proper religious thing. And they come in and they meet the holy man of Israel, Simeon, who's been looking for the redemption of Israel his whole life. And, he's, and so is Anna. They're all there waiting for the Messiah. And this fulfillment of the prophet Malachi, suddenly into the temple will come the Lord whom you've been seeking. I don't know if you remember that prophecy from Malachi, but it was the last prophet of the Bible. And the last prophecy of the Bible is, lo, suddenly the one you're looking for will appear in the temple. And of course, Luke, Luke's gospel intends us to recognize that this is Jesus. But of course, he's coming in a form that is completely different than anybody expected. And this is why John the baptizer uh, later would, would send his apostles saying, are you the one we're supposed to look for? Because Jesus was just the opposite of what they were expecting. They were expecting a, a kind of a Rambo type, a kind of Arnold Schwarzenegger on steroids, both guns blazing, 
uh, eliminating all the enemies of Israel and establishing the, 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 the chosen people as the rulers of the world sitting on the, even the apostles say, hey, when you come into your kingdom, can we sit on 12 thrones? Can my, can my sons, the mother comes and says, hey, I know you're going up to Jerusalem now and, and you're about to manifest your glory. Can my, can my sons sit on your right and on your left? So everybody kind of misunderstood Jesus, but let's come. But so, so the first appearance of the Messiah in the temple is as an infant. And nobody other than maybe Simeon, a person like Simeon or Anna, people who had been contemplatives. See, there's also an echo here with Simeon and Anna. They have already lost their families. We're not even sure if Simeon was ever married. But the prophecy that Simeon is going to make to Mary and, and the things that Jesus is going to later say about families reveal the true meaning of family. And Kathy, I am going to get to your question because it's directly linked when, when, so, 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 so I got a lot of irons in the fire here. Let me, let me clarify. So Simeon and Anna are figures in Israel who are in a certain sense, well, m m let me start with, with, with the ministry of Jesus. When he starts talking about family, he says to Mary, when he holds up Jesus, he says, you see this child, they're, they're just there for a nice religious ritual. They don't expect anything out of the ordinary. But the one who has already, because later in Jesus' ministry, he's going to call us out of our families. He's going to, the first apostles, he calls them out of their father's boat. Boom pulls them right out. Their, their father, Zebedee, is left there. What happened to my two sons? Who, who was that masked man? Boom, just went right by. So, so in the ministry of Jesus, so, so he says things in his ministry like, no one can be a follower of mine unless he hates his mother, father, sister, brother, wife, spouse, and children. No one can be a follower of mine unless they hate their family. <laughs> this is the and or or um, the enemy one's enemies will be those of his own household mother against mother-in-law daughter against mother-in-law sister against brother father against son the enemies will be those of his own household I have cut people think I've come to bring peace but I've come to bring division from now on you will be divided in your families two against three three against two mother against daughter-in-law so you see this, Christ knows that he's going to be a stumbling block for people. He's going to be a, div a divider, actually. He comes to bring peace. But his message of peace is so radical and so new and so revolutionary that it ends up dividing. The very thing he comes to establish he undermines by the power of his message because most of the world is still locked into a different way of thinking. They are still in the grip of the accuser and the deceiver. So they are still in the world of darkness, but he is the light who has appeared in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. But it takes a long time. It takes eternity for the darkness to become acclimated to the light, and it takes eternity or takes as long as God decides it's going to take for the light to completely dispel the darkness. Okay, now all of this is yet to come. All these sayings about Jesus, he, but he says to his mother, this child of yours is destined to be a sign of contradiction. Later, referring to this same prophecy, Jesus would say, blessed is the person who finds no stumbling block in me. I have come that you may have peace, but not as the world gives peace. Do I give peace to you? Blessed is the person who does not find a stumbling block in me. Blessed is the person who does not find me a sign of contradiction. Blessed, of, blessed is the person who does not find my words and my way of life and my demands scandalous. Blessed is the person who is not scandalized by me. Blessed is the person who does not hate me. Blessed is the person for whom I am not too much to take. These are all the phrases that Jesus used because he knew 
that he was introducing to the world a, a, a food and a reality that was too much for them to take. In fact, he knew that they couldn't take it all in one, all in one dose. Jesus comes into the world like the Americans rolled up to the gates at the concentration camps. Their trucks were loaded with food. Kathy, I'm still getting to your question, believe it or not. It's, 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 I, got, I got to do this hour, hour of preparation before we give you the answer. Because all of it is contained. Well, anyway, we're going to. So, so when the Americans rolled up to the concentration camps, they wanted to liberate the, the, the slaves, the, the captives. When Jesus came into the world, he came into the world to liberate. He didn't, you know, and we, we're not going to review this today, but those two models of salvation. He didn't come into the world to pay the price for our sins. He came into the world to rescue sinners. I have come to seek and save that which is lost. I have come to, to I have not come to condemn the world. I have come to rescue the world. And who am I rescuing the world from? Not from God, not from God's anger. I'm coming into the world to rescue the world from the deceiver, from the power of darkness that has enveloped the minds and hearts, even of religious people. In fact, in some sense, more, more, the darkness of the deceiver has, has, has darkened the hearts of religious people in some sense, even more than ordinary atheists, because they have no other agenda than doing their own thing. In some ways, the unbeliever is much easier to respond to the message and, and, and revelation of Christ than those who have already hardened into their ways of their, fa their family, their blood kinship. This is just the way we do things in our family here or the larger family of the religion. This is the way we do things here. This is the way we've always negotiated our relationship with God. Moses gave us the law. Are you greater than our father Moses? Solomon built this temple. Are you greater than our father Solomon? And Jesus said, in both cases, yes, I am. <laughs> and whoa, they tore out their hair, and he became a stumbling block to them. And he became a stumbling block primarily to those who were so ensconced in their religion, even though they said they were looking for the deliverer, they were so imprisoned by their own mindset and by the, by the layer of super glue that religion puts over your own mindset. It really hardens into a kind of spiritual epoxy that, that, that takes the Holy Spirit to, to pierce through. So Jesus knew that what he was bringing into the world was going to cause a cataclysm in the world. He knew it was going to lead to his death. He knew that. Not because God was trying to exact some kind of honor killing for an, an original offense somewhere back there. That's the one narrative of salvation that we're always trying to move around here and, and, and divest ourselves of. But, but he, he knew that just because the, the clash of the light with the darkness, the darkness goes into a rage when the light threatens its domination over the world. So, so Satan and all his minions, which I want to talk a little bit about later on as well, um, they, they go into apoplexy when the light of the world appears, but it appears as a child. And this is what's so scandalous. This is another part of the stumbling block. How can a helpless, powerless, defenseless infant be the antidote to all the Hitlers in the world? How can this little child, how can, how can a man, this is where John the Baptist was scandalized, how can a man with no weapons other than mercy and truth combat the forces of evil in this world? Look at the Romans, look at their cannon fodder, look at their arms. How can this, how can this innocent man conquer those kingdoms? And really the message of Jesus, my son is on this call, so I'm gonna use a, a, a metaphor that's very dear to him and dear to me. His screen name on his email is be like water. And the message of Jesus to use a different metaphor is that water, though it's it's innocent, it's harmless, it, it's, it's 
It's invisible, it's tasteless, it's the epitome of humility, water. Kathy, maybe this starts to get to your question. It comes from the side of Christ. Water is the most humble substance on the face of the earth. You can't see it, you can't, it, it doesn't sting going down, there's no pain associated with it. It, 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 it cleanses, it heals, it gives buoyancy, but it's utterly, um, it always seeks the lowest place. It appears to have no rigidity at all, and yet it's stronger than steel, stronger than rock. Don't believe me? Ask the Grand Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> a little drop of water on a, uh, look at the Titanic. The Titanic was supposed to be stronger than God, right? It sank, and now water is doing its thing. And water is an image. You know, we're going to, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here because I, I talked to somebody yesterday saying I can, I'm starting to buy the theory that, that all, all men may be saved. All people may be saved given God's mercy and Jesus' message of mercy. I'm starting to believe that maybe all people will eventually be saved, even Hitler. But I still can't get there with the, with Satan and the fallen angels. How, how can they be saved as well? So I want to, I want to talk a little bit about that. I don't know why I even mentioned that just now. What was I just saying? Water. Well, water. water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so if we only we 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 don't know. How, so, so just like water takes a million years to dissolve steel, but in but given enough time, steel is defenseless against water. Similarly, given enough time. Resistance is defenseless. The steel of, of disobedience, the steel of pride, the steel of I will not serve. No, I'm not going to my room. <laughs> no, I'm not obeying. The, the, the resistance, the spine in our steel is ultimately defenseless, ultimately defenseless against the mercy of God because the mercy of God acts like air and like water. It it dissolves without violence. It changes without violence. There's no violence in God. There's no animosity in God. There's no, there's no resistance in God. There's no obstreperousness in God, no adversarial, no accusatory tones. None of that is there. God is light in whom there is no darkness, the first letter of John. Um, God, God is light. I am the light of the world. You are the light of the world. That's what Jesus said to his apostles. So it was the, ve the, very, the very scandalous nature of the innocence of this child that, and Mary herself was scandalized at a certain level because Simeon says, this child is going to break your heart. How can, how can the son of God break my heart? She's what maybe, because it says Mary pondered all these things in her, it, it, it caught her up short. And, and it didn't take long for Mary to begin to experience the truth of Simeon's prophecy. Just 12 years later, you remember when they came to the temple to, to again, to present their, their annual worship to God. And on the way back, they thought they were with his, he was with his cousins and James and John and all those kids that were related to Mary and Joseph by Joseph's previous marriage, perhaps. Uh, well, they get a day down the road and they realize he's not with us. So they so they search for him in vain. You know, I, I said, uh, so so already Mary, I mean, so I, I in, in my homily, I said that one time when my son Ben and I were at Chuck E. Cheese when he was growing up as a kid, he said, hey, I could use some more tickets. So I said, okay, I'll be right back. Stay right here. So I went to get the tickets. I came back just 30 seconds later. No Ben. I'm telling you, my hair was on fire. I, I, my, my blood pressure, I'm surprised I didn't stroke out right, right then and there. I mean, it was, it was the most panicked three minutes, three or four minutes of my life. And there were a million kids in Chuck E. Cheese. And you know, predators are just looking for that one little opening and say, come with me, I've got, I've got something to, oh my God, oh my God. 
I probably also was thinking, what will his mother say? Uh, yeah. <laughs> But I, but I, I, no, I really wasn't thinking that. I, I'm telling you, I thought my life had ended and, and I can't remember. Uh, he probably even told me I'm going over here. And anyway, three minutes later, I found him. And, I, and I, I mention that now because you can imagine what Mary went through for three days and you can imagine what she must have felt like when she finally discovered him. She probably wanted to, I mean, you can see it. She's, she's, um, I don't know that she, you would call she's angry, but she's a woman after all. <laughs> she, was mad. she was really mad. You know, it's anger is not a mad, it's a sin. It's just an emotion. And she, and you can see her, her control there. She says, son, why have you done this to us? And he turns to her. Now this is, this is the slap in the face. He says, didn't you know? More like, why didn't you know? I must be about my father's business. Translation, I don't belong to you. I came through you and I am yours at one level, but I belong to another. Joseph is also there and he's insulting Joseph too. He's saying, don't you understand? I have to be in my father's house. Mary probably wants to say, your father's house is up in Nazareth. Get the hell up there. <laughs> Mary, did you know? Mary, Mary, did you know? And so, so Mary herself, even a person who was immaculately conceived, had to have thrown in her face the bucket of cold water that Jesus was. He's trying to awaken fallen humanity from its nightmare, from its from its from its intoxication with deception. Okay, and so. It's ironic on the Feast of the Holy Family that you have these prophecies of family division of the son who's going to be a sign of contradiction. And he is going to split families and he is going to split nations and he is going to split communities and he's going to split families right down the middle. My son, my, 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 I'm the oldest of five boys. My, my, me and my youngest son, my son, youngest brother, Chris, are very close because of our mutual faith. The other three brothers whom I love have no interest at all in religion. In fact, think it's done a lot of damage in the world, which at one level it has. So we're not on the same wavelength. So we don't have that much in common with those other three brothers, though we get together at certain times. So I don't want to make this a, a thing about that. So, um, so moving towards um, moving towards uh, Kathy's question. So when when we hear your sword, your your heart will be pierced by a sword. You can see all those times when he showed up and and they said. So you see how her heart was pierced there when she heard why why did you not know I must be in my father. In other words, it's your problem, not mine. Same thing at Cana. They had they have no wine. His answer to her in Greek and Aramaic, translated into Greek, sounds something like, that's your, how's that my problem? That's your problem, woman. <laughs> he says, woman, now actually it's a, it was really, woman, when it's, when we hear that in the gospel, woman, how is this a concern of mine? Uh, it really sounds like my lady, my, my, madam. So it's a very polite, but he's basically, madam, how, how does this concern me? This is not this is not my problem. Of course, she blows him off and says, "Do whatever he tells you." <laughs> okay, but uh, and then how about the times when she would try to get a word into him while he was out on? Well, how about when he left her house and said, "Now I'm going to have to leave you alone as a widow. It's my time to go, and I'm going. I'm going to my death, <laughs> pierced by a sword." And then when she tried to make contact with him while he was out wandering about Galilee and down in Judea, they say, hey, your mom's here to see you. He doesn't even look behind him. He says, who is my mother? Here. Here's, it'd be like my mother's sitting here. And, they, and, they, and Jesse says, your mother wants to talk to you. And I say, here, you, here are my mother. Here's my mother and my brothers. Everyone who listens to me and absorbs my word in their heart. This is my mother, my brother, and my sister. In other words, Jesus is calling us out of our, 
He's calling us, what he's trying to reveal to us is that we come into this world from the family of the Trinity. Our only, fa our only true family is the Trinity. We, are, we come into this world through a chromosomal arrangement on God's part that makes us a member of a human family. But that human family and every member in that human family actually belongs to a larger family above it from whence it comes. And it's the bond of communion that comes from the Trinity that is meant to create the bond of marriage. Marriage, two people hooking up in a civil service saying we belong to each other is part of the darkness. It's, an, it's a ritual that we go through in the, what we call the secular world. The secular world is the world of the accuser, the deceiver, and the world of darkness. The, 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 the ruler of this world is called the prince of darkness. It has its own, it has its own sacraments which are kind of the opposite of the sacraments of the church, where we are, where we, where we treasure marriage for life, they, they, they treasure abortion for the destruction of life. So there's a, there's a whole series of anti-sacraments that the world of darkness has that, that, that the secular society plays tribute to and worships at the altar of. I'm not going to get into that today, but every, every one of the seven sacraments of the, of the Christian church, you could correspond with one of the sacraments of the culture of death. But so a civil service of marriage is not what we would call a sacrament because it does not in any sense spiritually or that is to say intentionally open itself to a bond of communion beyond the two persons who are entering into the contract. In a civil marriage, it's an agreement and it has conditions. And it says, under these conditions, I will live with you. And under these conditions, we can go our separate ways. And we always, we always have an escape clause. We can always get out. But in God's world, there is no getting out because there's no desire to get out. There's simply a desire to draw everybody else in. <laughs> when I'm in God's world, I mean, talk about the people who have the near-death experiences. They never want to get out. They don't want to come back here. They don't want to, they don't want to come back to the world of light, darkness from the world of light. And so Christianity, so Christ comes into the world from that world of the Trinity and he comes in to show us that, in truth, we all come from that world as well. Before, before you were conceived in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before the foundation of the world, you were, you were made to be holy and blameless in his sight. So, so Christ is one with the prophets there, that before your mother conceived you, before you had these blood ties, you already were a member of my family. You have been known by the Father since before the creation of the world so that you can come into this world and communicate the same bonds of communion, the same family bonds that are at the source of all families. The source of family life is the tri triune mystery of God. You can say that God is the Ur family, the original family, the origin of all communion, the origin of all. And, and it's not just, you see, in, in this family of God, it's not just, it's not just marriage that God is talking about. Any form of friendship is a form of spiritual marriage if it's anchored in the in the if, if it's if it's somehow connected to the Trinitarian love. And that's why Jesus wants to draw people. That's why he calls people out of their families. That's why he divides families, five against two, three against one. That's why, I mean, he wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the Trinity. God desires all people to enjoy the communion that he has had with his father from all eternity and that we were created by the Trinity to have both with the Trinity and with each other. Everything is about, so the purpose of human life is for God to share his Trinitarian familial bondedness with everything in creation. 
and not not just people communicating with each other, but people also in concert with nature. In 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 the Garden of Paradise, Adam and Eve talked to the animals, and there was a communication. There was a gentleness. Saint Francis of Assisi, certain saints, especially in the Christian East, have been known to wolves come in. You know, I mean, the prophecy of Isaiah: the 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 child shall play in the adder's lair. The lion shall lie down with the lamb. You know, there are all kinds of stories about hermits and monks and Christian East, Catholic and Orthodox. The animals, the presence of God so much that they even these wild animals, wolves and tigers, come and lie down at the feet of these monks. Pet them, you know, kind of a kind of a proleptic glimpse of the kingdom of God. It is, it is quite possible. You know, you've heard about horse whisperers, right? But there are people who have a gift, even in the most dangerous circumstances, to communicate something of this presence of God that even, even quells the, the instincts of nature to seek out and destroy. So, so the kingdom of God you know, pre-existed this world, and the kingdom of God has appeared again in this world, and Christ has come into this world to establish, to re-establish the communion with God that was there in the beginning, and that communion, the, the, the community that, that he created in order to be kind of the petri dish for the new creation is what we call the church, but the church means those people, church doesn't refer to a building, doesn't refer to an institution, doesn't refer to a structure. It refers to a movement of people who have felt the call of God in the depths of their being, and it has become to them more important than their families. However, it so when Jesus says, unless you hate your mother, father, sister, and brother, what he's trying to say there is, if you, if you, if, if by the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, the, the belief in God, a sense of my connectedness with God, you know, faith comes through hearing. Let's say I'm on a gathering like this, and I, I hear that, that there is a God, and that this God is the source of my own existence, and that this God is present in every act of human love and that there is a mystery of love bringing people together. Let's say, I mean, I don't know how people end up believing in God, but as I believe in God and I begin to see the vision that Christ lays out for the way of relating to each other um, it is so appealing to me and so promising to me that I want to learn more about it. And I read the Gospels, and, I, and the Holy Spirit uses those words to touch me, and I, I start to see, and I, and I see in the witnesses of those first apostles, they're claiming he's not, these books aren't just written about a past historical figure, but they are pointing to a present reality that that, that, is, that, that, that you can communicate with if you do it through a simple act of trust and faith. And, and people begin to start believing that and they start to catch a little bit of this, they start saying, oh my God, I'm, I'm starting to get in touch with a power here that, that is dispelling my fears, is, is, is kind of re-educating my mind. I, I feel like I'm changing. I'm being, I'm being transformed somehow. Something, you know, people say, what's gotten into you? You know, oh, he got religion, you know? And of course, a lot of people short circuit this process by by holding on to some kind of formalistic or institutionalistic fundamentalist version of religion. And they start quoting scripture and they quite start beating you over the head with religious dogmas and religious commandments. And they, and they get very brittle about their faith. So there's a million ways in which the spiritual life can go wrong. Uh, most people prior to this current generation, because we now live in a post-Christian post world, okay, but it used to be, that most, most people, at least in America, and long ago it's gone away in Europe and it's going away in America as well, but long ago, everybody was educated in the faith of their parents. So everybody who knew who Jesus Christ was. I was at a 12-step support group meeting a couple of years ago and they said, okay, let's all stand now and say the Our Father and the Lord's Prayer. And the lady next to me said, what's the Lord's Prayer? You would have never you would have never heard that 20 years ago. Why don't you open the door? It's a little warmer. 
Uh, you would have never heard that 20 years ago because Christianity and belief in God and religious education and instruction in the basics of what Christianity believes was in most households, whether it was Catholic or Protestant, most people had heard the word Jesus Christ. Most people had read the gospels or at least heard parts of them somewhere, some way. Most people knew what the 10 commandments referred to. Most people re knew what the 10 commandments were. When I was growing up, we had 10 commandments of God and six commandments of the church. We knew all this stuff. We knew the Baltimore catechism. You could ask me any question about the Catholic faith. I could tell you there's, I, I'd be willing to wager a thousand dollars that you couldn't find 10 kids in the, in the normal fourth grade class of any Catholic grade school who could tell you what the Ten Commandments were. So be that as it may, I'm not lamenting that at all. In fact, I'm actually kind of rejoicing in that because the fruits that have been produced by years and years and years and years and years and years and, years and millions and millions and millions of dollars going towards Catholic education has produced the society we have. So to me, it hasn't done a whole lot. So, God is number one with me. Right. But I also feel that my childhood education nurtured that. Okay, I'm not. Even though some of the things we say, um, we're not so good about teaching religion. But so, I, I felt that I, I learned to love God as a child yeah. in school. Right. Okay. So, so all of us are grateful for our religious formation. Most of us caught our love of God through parents or religious educators who communicated that to us. Regardless of how the love of God comes to you, there are those for whom this love of God, once it touches them, and the notion of the love of God, and the notion of God himself. There are some people, just like with Jesus walking around, there were some people, when he walked by them, he changed their life forever. They left their fathers, they left their families, they followed him. Religious conversion, no matter what form it takes, actually even no matter what religion it takes, could be even be a Hindu religion, could be a Jewish religion, could be a Muslim religion, no matter what form it takes, when the Spirit of God touches a person, he, God immediately puts that person in touch with a reality that cannot be found in their family cannot be found in their job, cannot be found in the TV, cannot even be found in their religion. Their religion may bring them to it, but if their religion is functioning as it should, it should always be putting them in touch with an ecstasy, a, a knowledge, an awareness, an appreciation, and a joy that exceeds even the bounds of the religion. And when that has happened to a person, we kind of call that a conversion. People who are going through the motions, they have religion, but they've not had the kind of change of life that Christ was inviting his followers to join into. Because the Trinity and heaven is not a religious ceremony. It's a gathering of persons who are in perfect communion and love with each other in an absolutely non-violent, non-threatening, non-accusatory way. There is no darkness in it all. There's no rivalry. The opposite is the way that we tend to live, even in religious institutions at times. Rivalry, resentment, rage, retribution. That's the way of the world. That's the logos of the deceiver and the accuser. That's the logos. That's the that's what the word that's what the scriptures refer to as the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, but the world did not know him. It did not know him because they were operating on a different operating system. They were operating on the on the on the on the on the system of e the way you eliminate evil is by doing more evil. Do unto others as they have done unto you. That's the way of the world. The way of Christ is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So they're they're mirror opposites of each other. Okay. And and most people 
don't ever see that difference. They, 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 they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to be able to have the cake and not get fat. They, they want to have religion, but they want to cling to this dynamic of getting even with those who have harmed me. Okay, so Christ is, he comes into the world as a divine magnet from above. So he comes as a member of the divine family of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he starts initially by scandalizing the world. He starts initially by dividing the world. I've not come to bring peace. I've come to bring division. What did he mean by that? Come follow me. So the two brothers leave their father. So he's just divided a family. Okay. Um, I, unless, a fa unless a person leave their family, they cannot be a follower of mine. So people did. They came out of their family. So he comes initially as, as it were, a divider. You can almost say a destroyer. He comes into the world to destroy the works of Satan. But the works of Satan, by which I mean the logos of, re, of, of, of retributive violence, the, the, the cycle of getting back at those who have harmed me, the cycle of getting even, bearing grudges, and, and meeting out punishment, making things even. We call it justice, but in God's eyes, it's only vengeance. What we call justice, God calls vengeance. Okay? So all of our judgments about others, whenever we set ourselves up, whenever we eat that poisonous fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we have colluded with the powers of darkness. We've been deceived by the deceiver to set ourselves up as God. And in that act, we have alienated ourselves from God and become a prisoner and a slave to the evil one. Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So we are not free when we are slaves, even though we think we're free. In fact, sin, Satan convinces you, you're free to do any damn thing you want. Who, what are the consequences? You don't have to worry about a God or worry about anything else. After all, didn't that priest tell you God's not going to punish you anyway? You're free to do anything you want. Go ahead. He's advocating a kind of libertarian freedom that is not freedom at all. It's just doubling down on slavery. It's like a drug dealer saying, here, do that. You can do this. You're free to do this. It'll make you feel good. What, who's holding you back? You're free. So what looks like freedom to us, the ability to choose, is actually a form of slavery, but we don't know it because we are so immersed in it. Christ comes in the world to, to save us, to rescue us, to pull us out of that slavery. But, and he has such a hard time doing it because we are in it like fish are in water. We don't even know we're doing it. We, we kind of catch ourselves, oh my God, I was already holding a resentment against her. I didn't realize it until the Holy Spirit reveals to me, you're not being like water here. You're being like steel. You're, like, you're, you're, you're gonna hit her over the head with a baseball bat. You're, 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 you're resisting, you're, you're, you're now stuck in resistance. So, but even our sins, you see, are used by the Holy Spirit to alert us to our sins for the purpose of delivering us from them. So initially, Christ comes into this world of darkness, of, of death, of despair, of, of retribution, and he wants to rescue us from it. So he does it by touching people. I mean, his whole public ministry was a ministry of, of healing. He's, he came to people who were damaged by the world as it is, and he would try to make them whole again. I, I, the, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and the, and the poor have good news preached to them. I've come to proclaim a year of favor from the Lord. So Christ comes to, so, and so when he touches people with this love, they, they realize, like, I'm thinking of the woman caught in adultery. She, that presumably, let's just say for the sake of argument, though nobody really knows this, but let's say, let's say it was Mary Magdalene. Okay, we know that she became his most devoted follower. He was, she was the first person, maybe apart from Mary, though there's no Bible evidence for that, but maybe Mary Magdalene was the first person in the gospel that Jesus appeared to after he rose from the dead. They were just like this. In fact, there is an apocryphal gospel called the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, where this apocryphal writer 
talks about the relationship of Jesus with Mary Magdalene and how she was he, he she was his confidant to some to some extent. So they're very close. She became very devoted to him. And you can see there in a moment's instance where he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and go and be a slave to this sin no more. He's not saying to her, go and sin no more, lest God be angry at you, how it, like like it's normally interpreted by people who don't know any better. No, go go and sit. Go, go and no longer be a slave to sin. No, go, go no longer and subject yourself to that darkness, which is killing your not killing, but hurting your own, your own true self. I see your true self. Come come, come with me. Well, she he doesn't even say that. She just comes with him. She follows him. She becomes his devoted follower. So you can see that in his public ministry, wherever he went, he exercised such an attraction on people that, that, he, that he pulled them from their normal relationships. And ultimately, I mean, there were many who followed him, but apparently he pulled 12 most closely and another 72 kind of closely. And then there were others who followed and watched. You see, and this is the difference in the Christian church today, and, and it has always been the case. Christ has, Jesus has many admirers, but very few followers. Okay? I can come to church and admire the teaching of Christ, but to be a follower, I have to, I have to leave a certain mindset behind. And it usually has ramifications for how I live my life. I mean, you can see this in families when somebody, even, even fundamentalist families, when somebody gets religion and they say, I want to go to the Bible study tonight. Or even in our own lives, you know, they say, hey, there's a Bible study, uh, study happening. And you say, oh, I can't do that. It conflicts with my bowling. You see there... <laughs> Investing time in re my relationship with the Trinity is a decision that I, I mean, there, my priorities reflect. And so what Christ is saying is, you cannot get what I am offering you. And I'm I've only talked about the first part of this now. Christ divides in order to unite. Okay, I want to talk about that here too. And I'm Kathy, I haven't forgotten about your question. We're going to get to the cross, but we got to go through the ministry here first. So you can see that in his public ministry, he was a scandal. But there were those who were not scandalized by him, and they became his followers. Others were mad at him for taking their brothers away from the family. If you go to the Middle East, you'll see how. You know how in this country we have the the Italian vendetta. You know, you do something against my family, we're gonna get we're gonna get back at you. It, it multiply it by a thousand, and you have what's going on in the Middle East. If you go into an Arab or an Israeli family in the Middle East, any family in Palestine or the Middle East, all throughout the Arab world, you go to any, you go there. Family is everything. I mean, if if I mean, fa and family honor is everything. So if 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 you know, we we talked about the honor killing killings in the past. If a Muslim girl talks to a Christian boy, much less a Jewish boy, her father will kill her in certain sects of Islamic religion. They have to do it to preserve the honor of the family. She's brought shame on our family. You've heard about. The notion of bringing shame, you brought shame on our family, you, you put a black mark on our family, we have to erase that black mark and usually to do that, some murder is involved. See Christ was came into the world to destroy that notion of a step, he came to destroy the idolatry of the human family. But he loves families because he knows that families are the launching pad to faith. But he also knows that those who get faith within a family will also be the ruination of that family. But they won't be the ruin. And here's the important point. He comes to destroy in order to recreate. He comes to tear down in order to reconstruct. 
that temple. You see this temple, it will dissolve, but I will raise it up in three days. You see this organized religion of Israel, it's going to come collapsing down, but from the ashes is going to emerge myself as the resurrected Lord and the entire Christian church with me. And the Israelite church will look like a relic in, 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 the, in comparison with what's going to come from my death and resurrection. So everything with Christ is this Paschal mystery. It's this dissolution of deception, the dissolution of rigidity, the dissolving of, of the structure of retaliative violence and family honor, the destruction of, of institutional um, idolatry. In other words, holding on to the way we do things now the, the, the way we operate, Christ comes in to say, no, the way you're operating is bringing the world into hell. In fact, it's creating a living hell out of the world. You have to replace your operating system with my operating system. So I have to do heart surgery on the world. I have to remove its heart and I have to replace it with my heart. And so I'm coming into the belly of the beast and the way, and, and paradoxically, the way that this transformation of society is going to happen is I'm going to allow you to do your thing on me. I'm going to allow you to exercise your logic of murder upon me because when you murder me, I'm going to rise from the dead and dissolve your power to murder anybody. Spouse, and uh, they, you yeah, like fall in love with somebody. No, all marriages are arranged. Yeah, in the east. Okay, so now when these when a person is called out of their family into this larger reality of communion with the Trinity that Christ introduces into the world, Christ is trying to create a new humanity. The church is meant to be God's experiment in the new creation. Now, and this new creation is already manifest. You have Mother Teresa, you have John Paul II, you have Mahatma Gandhi, you have people who have literally been reborn. And when they look back on their blood families, okay, and here's my point, Christ divides families for the purpose of establishing the human family on a deeper, more Trinitarian basis, okay? But, but God knows that spirit, spirit is stronger, spirit is stronger than blood, okay? And so, Kathy, to, 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 to answer your question, that's the most important image in a sense in the, in the New Testament. When so Christ came into the world to replace the world's way of doing things with God's way of doing things, which is forgive as you have been forgiven. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against. Evil is defeated, according to Jesus. Evil is defeated not by retaliation, but by reconciliation. And reconciliation often means acknowledging what I have done wrong, and in some times even making restoration for what I've done wrong, but it never involves retaliation because I'm mad at what has been done wrong, okay? So Christ has come into the world, to, to really emphasize it here for a minute, Christ has come into the world to replace retaliation and retribution and violence with reconciliation and what the Bible calls justice. Justice means restoring broken relationships back to their original happiness with a new dose of happiness up on top of them because of the reconciliation that has occurred. Okay. And the way he's going to do that is to allow himself to be killed. He's going to demonstrate it on the cross. He goes to the cross not to pay the debt for our sins. He goes to the cross to demonstrate how this works. <laughs> These people hate me because I am trying to teach them about a love that they know not of. 
These people hate me. I've come into the world to bring peace and they want to kill the Prince of Peace. I've come into the world to bring love and they want to put love to death. And I'm going to let them put love to death to show them that they can't put love to death. Because love is what envelops this body and love is what will raise this body up to give a good translation of what Christ meant by three days I will raise you up. Love cannot be destroyed, just like matter cannot be destroyed. It can only be converted into energy. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it from the dead. So Christ goes to the cross to demonstrate what he's been teaching all along. Forgive those who hate you and pray for those who persecute you. His last words on the cross are, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They are still in slavery to the deceiver. They are still, their minds and hearts are still darkened. Have mercy on them. And into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And, and so... And, and at that point, and, and so, so they kill him, and after he's dead, after his body is dead, after, he is dead, but he is, he, like us, is not identical with his body. Jesus is not his body. Jesus is not, none of us are our bodies. We, we, the persons we are, we have bodies. God has given us bodies. To, to put on display for the world the person that he made each of us to be. But the person has the body, the body doesn't have the person. And the person doesn't die with the body. The instrument of personal expression in this world eventually wears out. But the person goes on forever and the body will also be rejoined to the person as an instrument of expression, even in the next world, whatever that is and whatever that looks like. Okay, so the same thing is the case with Jesus. So he, he, he is one with his father and for a while a, appeared through the instrument of this body that came from the womb of Mary. That body was buried and was raised in a new form by the power of love, the one he called his father. And, and, and has been made accessible to us mysteriously in the sacrament called the Eucharist and more mysteriously in our interactions with each other because Jesus promised wherever two or three are gathered, there I am in their midst. So, so this risen Christ is present in every person, in every human interaction, he is there. And for those who have eyes to see, they will recognize him in the face of every person they meet, and actually even in the visible, all the other forms of visible creation. Uh, now, when they put the spear in his side on the cross, out of that flowed um, water, blood and water, okay? So what the, what the evangelist is telling us there is, or as Pope St. Leo the Great said it in the early church, he said, everything that, was in Christ, everything that was in Christ Jesus, which is what what was in Christ, so this historical person, what was in him? He was the eternal word of God. He was the second person of the Trinity, right? He was also the son of Mary. And he had all these brothers and sisters, cousins, basically. And he was in communion with his heavenly father. So he has, as a human being, he has a divine father and a human mother. And on the cross, when the soldier punctures, punctures his side, Pope Leo said, at that point, that water and blood symbolized the pouring forth of everything that was in Christ Jesus, the Spirit in particular. The Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit flowed out of Christ from the cross. The Holy Pentecost, in a way, began 
there when Christ's side was pierced on the cross. It's a pouring out of the Holy Spirit. What, what it's, what, what it's, it, these things are difficult to describe because you're talking about a Trinitarian event there, okay? The Father sent the Son into the world so the Son could unleash the spirit of Trinitarian communion upon us. And the blood and water flowing from the side of Jesus on the cross is a visible image of the release of, Trini of the Trinitarian mystery upon the world. The water and the blood come down. All this stuff is symbolic of the water and the blood covering the world. You know, like, uh, you know, that image they show sometimes of Sherwin-Williams paint, you know, we cover the world where you see the paint. Yeah. In, that's that's the image that John is trying to convey with the with the crucifixion scene, the blood and the water. Now, in the early church, they compared the blood and the water coming from the side of Christ as images of water was meant to be an image of baptism, and blood was meant to be an image of the Eucharistic cup, the blood of Christ. Okay, but both of them are trying to say God has poured out upon the world a share in his own Trinitarian life. That's, that's what that image is trying to convey. The, the Trinitarian life, this life of the new creation that Christ, that Christ Jesus brought into the world is no longer now, no longer confined to the body of the man from Nazareth. That body has been dissolved. Everything that Christ was the incarnation of, which is Trinitarian communion, that body has now dissolved and turned into this blood and water, the Eucharistic mysteries of baptism and Eucharist, but also the Holy Spirit, which, which is larger than baptism and the Eucharist. It, it has now enveloped the whole earth. The, the, whole, the Spirit of God has flowed from the side of Christ. Remember, he, even in his resurrection, he continued this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Everything after the death of the Jesus, after the death of Jesus on the cross, is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It says he breathed his last. That last breath, that last breath was the breathing of the Holy Spirit. When his side was pierced on the cross, that was a visible image of the outflowing of the Holy Spirit. When he appeared to his apostles in the upper room, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. You see, and when they receive the Holy Spirit, they also breathe it upon everybody they meet, you know. Uh, so like in Easter, the Easter vigil, you know, when we come and we, we there's one candle to begin with. So think of that one candle that comes down the aisle. Think of that as the historical Jesus. He's a, he's a light in the darkness that the darkness cannot overcome. And then, and then the apostles come at the cross and they light their candles from that light. The pouring of the water and the, and the blood out of the side of Christ is like the light being lit. All the water that, if you saw the Mel Gibson film, it came down on the soldier. It was like a gusher that drenched him. And that and, and that and that that soldier became one of the first saints of the Christian church, died because he was called out of the army. He left the he left the family of the army to become a disciple of Christ, and they killed him for it. So he was washed in blood, but he, he had the conversion. So you can see that soldier was kind of washed in the trinitarian life of god it recreated him he became a follower of christ and then he was washed in the blood of the lamb by his own death in the arena later on um, so this the outpouring of the holy spirit is this sanctification of people so so i said on i'm rambling here a little bit i realize i'm just jumping all over the place today here but when those people who were originally when jesus calls people out of their families into this into this trinitarian family that he's trying to create in this mystery that we call the ecclesia or the church this is the place where the holy spirit like that water and blood flowing from the side of christ it not only drenches that soldier, but it's drenching all of us. Jesus was called the Christ because the word Christ means the anointed one. And what was Christ anointed with? He was anointed with the Holy Spirit. 
this man speaks to us with authority, they said. The spirit, his first prophecy in Nazareth, he read the scroll from Isaiah. Remember, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. They felt the power of his words. The power of his words were the power of the spirit. And that same spirit he breathed on his apostles. So, so Christians are known by that name. I mean, if you really wanted the right translation of, we say we're a Christian, we would say we are, we are one of the anointed ones. And what are we anointed with? We are anointed with the light of God. We are, we are illumined with the light of God. We are anointed with the oil of salvation. The blood and the water are images of this holy anointing, this being drenched in whatever it was that was in Christ Jesus. All that was in Christ Jesus has now been poured out upon us. It's symbolized by the pouring of the water on the head of the baby at baptism or the adult. It's symbolized by the giving of the, of the cup and the host at communion. It's symbolized by all those seven ways that we have of symbolizing it. But they're all pointing to the same reality, that those who gather together in his name receive a fresh outpouring, a fresh anointing of that power of Trinitarian love that was in him. That's why every Mass is a Trinitarian event. It's the family of the Trinity pouring out and anointing those who have been called out of their families. I mean, I, I said last week at, at the homily, I said, how many people are sitting here in church today who are just the only members of their family who still go to church? How many are sitting here who would not love to have all their kids with them, but the kids don't come anymore? How many are here who would love to have their grandkids with them here, but they're not here? How many are here who would love to have their spouse with them, but are not here? You see, one is taken, one is left behind. But the good news is this, and I said this to people, even though there are very few of us here, and in the future, there'll be even fewer of us. Those who do hear the call, and those who do respond, and those who do gather, they also become anointed. They also receive this spirit of God. In fact, it's the spirit of God that draws us there in the first place. And the reason I'm glad religion, for the most part, is going away, that we live in a post-Christian world, um, is, is because I am, I am happy that there won't be any people there who are just going there to please their parents or going there because their mother a long time ago told them they should go there or else they won't go to heaven. All the, all the extrinsic reasons, all the, all the fear-driven reasons, all the artificial reasons to go to, to mass, uh, they're all gone now, or at least I hope they will all be gone soon. Then those who come will be those who are looking for a way of doing family, a way of being family, a way of contacting the family of, of the Trinity and want to be immersed in that family. And when they are, this is what I said to the people on Sunday, when you come here and are enfolded into the tri triune embrace of God, then when you go back to your family, those same Trinitarian bonds are in you. you, you People who come into the mystery of the Trinitarian Eucharist are anointed with the Trinitarian love of God. And when they go back, if, they, if their hearts are totally, to the extent that they are open and that they are really doing this in faith, to the extent that they are like Mary, where they come to Mass really wanting to end, enter into this not just the family of the Trinity, but a spiritual marriage with the Holy Spirit and with Christ himself to the glory of the Father. The more Catholics start seeing their relationship with God as a nuptial mystery, the more their own marriages will be sanctified as a byproduct. And the more their families will be united as a byproduct. A person who is I, I hesitate to use the word say, a, a person who is deified, a person who is divinized, a person who is anointed to the point of having all the darkness driven out of them, 
again, I'm thinking of, we just use the typical, just like we use Hitler for the incarnation of evil, we use Mother Teresa for the incarnation of good, okay? Just, just like a person, every, every Catholic is supposed to be just like Mother Teresa, so taken by the person of Christ that, that they see themselves in a spousal relationship with him, even if they are married. They will realize that my, first, my real spousal relationship is with God. If God is my spouse, my marriage is, 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 is sanctified as a byproduct of that. Every person that a divinized person touches is also, to a certain extent, divinized. The church is meant to be a place where people are Pulled the world, the word for church in Greek is ecclesia. Ecclesia means to be pulled out of, to be drawn out of. See, Jesus is pulling people, kicking and screaming sometimes, pulling them, but he doesn't pull too hard because he because he's against violence. <laughs> so he calls, he invites people. Remember the rich young man. He invited him. Come. Just leave. You, you lack one thing. Leave these possessions you have. They're holding you down like the Lilliputians holding down Gulliver. You want to follow me, but you're being held down by all your attachments, by all your possessions. You're not free. You're a slave. You've kept all the religion. You've come to mass every week. You've done all the right religious things, but you lack one thing necessary, you're still too attached to your possessions. Give those all away, and then you will be free of the slavery of sin. And then come follow me. And he, he couldn't do it. They say later, there's a tradition in the early church, that later he did get free of all his possessions. After Christ rose from the dead, he became a follower of Christ in the early Christian community. Um, but, but at that time, he couldn't do it. And Christ didn't really, he tried Christ tries to pull us. He comes to pull us out of here. In John, he says, when I am lifted up, I will drag all people to myself. He will eventually go down into hell and pull up Adam and Eve and pull them. But you see this world and, and the evil one and the darkness and the logos of this world, it, op it operates like quicksand. People get into it and they are, they are, um, they are pulled um, they are pulled down. I, we, the, our, our possessions, our families, our blood ties, our way of doing things, uh, even our religion has such a such a chokehold on us, such a such a gravitational entropy to it. It's very difficult for the spirit to raise a person from the status quo into what they were created to be before the foundation of the world. And that's what Christ comes to do. And in the beginning, I mean, through God's providence, mysteriously, only a few come. And he started with 12, right? He started with 12. But they became his completely. And when they went back, they then brought what they had received from him to their families, okay? Not, not even so much to teach their families. A person who's who really becomes a saint? By that I mean a person who is in a who experiences themselves as in a nuptial relationship with God. Thomas Merton says this so powerfully. He says the saint doesn't ever have to utter a word about God, just the way they handle things, the way they move, the way they speak, the way they relate with you. They communicate a love that they don't even have to use words. To describe it, if you're if you're called to use words, I guess I'm called to use words. Then you should use words. But faith, the faith, the, the nuptial relationship with Christ is caught. It's not taught. You can't tell somebody. You can tell somebody to go to church, but you can't tell somebody have a spousal. I mean, I can encourage it, but it you, you can't talk yourself into it. You have to you have to open yourself to it. Okay. You have to experience it. So Christianity is an experience, not, 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 a, 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 it's an experience. It's an encounter. 
It's a, it's a, it's an existential transformation. And until that happens, all the words you use, they'll, they'll just be like Formica on, on a tabletop. They're just a, they're just a thin layer of, of religious pretense. Religion is trying to get us to come into communion with a reality that is more important than any other reality, and the whole reality taken together, it's more important than. And once I plug into that, then I'm able to use the things of this world, and I'm able to be in relationships with my family, even difficult relationships, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit acts like WD-40, you know, in relationships that are stuck. It works like a lubricant on ball bearings in relationships. You know, I mean, I mean, how many of our relationships are like, like, like brake rotors, right? That have lost the, the padding. Oh man, sparks are flying, gonna start the engine on. The Holy Spirit is like oil. It's an anointing. It's like oil. It's like that water, that blood and water from the side of Christ. It it comes down on the gears of this world and it lubricates them. But it but it's really trying to transform them. It's like trying to take them from, from the kind of cars we drive now to drive a Tesla, you know, which is silent and doesn't use gas. It's a, it's a total transformation that Christ is, is, is uh, I think Gretchen made me. No? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, help her. You used a word just recently, pretense, pretense. And in today's first reading, it used that word. It said pretentiousness is is yep. is not of God but of the world. Right. And the thought occurred to me that pretentious might be an umbrella term for everything that yep. you talk about about yep. the, the accuse, accusation, sure. uh, yeah. judgment, judgment. Yep. Pretending would would be to make us uh, partaking of the knowledge of good and evil, making ourselves remaking ourselves into something other right. than what God created. Right. So pretense is recreation of oh, that's something right. that's ourselves. right that's right yeah so i don't know how many of you on the zoom could hear that but earl earl was saying i that he's heard me use the word pretense a couple of times in the in the sharing today and the first reading from the first letter of john uh, today tells us that all that god abhors it doesn't use those exact words but that's the point god abhors all pretentiousness Remember, Jesus was also inveighing, right, against the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests. They, he says they like to dress up in their robes. They like to have obsequious gestures directed in their direction. They want to be held in seats of honor. They want to be, they like to preen, they like to pretend that they really are somebody. And Earl's point was all pretense comes from thinking that I know better than somebody else what God is all about or what you should be all about. And that pretense comes, the pretense is another synonym for the original sin. Pretense comes from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where I believe I know what is the measure of good and what is the measure of evil. And so I'm able to decide for you and for everybody else, including myself, what's good and what's evil. And, and, and as soon as I, it, it, all pretense originates in that, in that mistaken belief. So I am deceived when I think I know what's right for myself or for others. I am deceived. Are we all pretenders? We are all pretenders in that sense, okay? Because all of us come out, are born into the world being taught to make critical judgments of others. We, we inherit it from our families. That's another reason Jesus wants to call us out of our families because our families all have built-in judgments about other families, other races, other politics, other nationalities, other neighborhoods, other, other Catholic grade schools, other families are the seedbed of, of promulgating pretensions. And then people get proud of it. My family, stay, our family has always done it this way. It's all pretense. What if I was done in my 
It's all <laughs> pretense. Every family, almost every family does it except the Holy Family, okay? They had no pretense other than looking to God for his wisdom. They, they didn't judge anybody. They didn't, they, they accepted people. They, did, they could recognize evil when they saw it, but they did not condemn it. Jesus was raised well by his mother. Neither do I condemn you. I've not come into the world to condemn the world. I've come into the, to rescue the world from its propensity to condemn. And the propensity to condemn, the propensity to divide, another word for the devil is the diabolos, the divider. It all comes from the same thing, division, accusation, pretense, darkness, um, uh, uh, re 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 violence. It's all from that same origin of thinking, I know better. God, did God really tell you not to eat from, God knows better than that. He's always, he, here's the devil trying to tell you you're smarter than God. He's smarter than God. Okay, so once I buy, buy that lie, I, I am immediately sold into slavery. And the more I get involved in this slavery of pretense and thinking I know, and I am, I am so sure about this, and I am so right in this regard, once I get into that state, the deeper into slavery I get, the freer I think I am, the more above it all I think I am. But I, and, and I'm like Icarus, I'm flying towards the sun, but my wings are going to burn off and I'm going to fall and crash to the ground pretty soon. I love the brief you can't. Gretchen said, God even loves the priests who are pretentious. <laughs> That's true. We are and, my, and, we and so, yeah. Us, okay. And uh, afterwards, um, that the best man went up to the, to the guy and he said, it was a lovely wedding. And he said, all oh, our oh, weddings are very lovely. Oh, 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 <laughs> So let me let me just pause it there. I, I'm kind of uh, like a downhill skier here. I, I need to find a tree to stop at because <laughs> otherwise I won't be able to stop myself. Um, yeah, I, I, Kathy, I don't know that I really answered your question except to say it's an image of of this of this new way of life that Christ is is scandalously introducing into the world it's an image of that new life now covering the entire world and yet its fruits have been manifested in only a very few people who have been able to grasp this vision that we're talking about and have hearkened to the words of Christ and are and have given themselves over to this trinitarian mystery of love and and are very much aware of it and know what it feels like to swim in it and know 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 what it feels like to be one with God and 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 how they want all their brothers and sisters also to know it but also they know that they are not able to receive it for whatever reason at this time, because that's not just where they are at this time. So, so not everybody has been um, not everybody has been recreated by this Trinitarian love that flowed from the side of Christ on the cross. But in time, they will. Uh, I mean, I don't know how they cannot. Um, but but right now, it's like. The, the, it's like the world has been recreated, but you can see the new growth only in certain people that we call saints. You can see that, yeah, uh, you, can see, you can see heaven on earth in a person who really knows God, but everybody else is still kind of wandering in darkness trying to find their way forward. And the light is spreading, but it's, it's spreading in a very mysterious way. Jesus even said that's how it was going to be. He said, you will plant the seed and God will give the growth and it will sprout up here and there and you won't know how and you don't, won't know when and you won't know why, but all of a sudden there'll be a harvest 60, 30, 100 fold. So. Kathy, I don't know if you were going to say something or if you'd like to. You have to unmute yourself. There you go. Oops, yeah. 
Yes, you explained it very well. I think I <laughs> understand. Okay, I don't. I, I didn't feel that way, but it, but if it was helpful to you, I'm happy. But but Father, how many people can be a Mother Teresa? How many people can do that? <laughs> All of us can do that. That's that's the that's the thing because there there's there's nothing to be done. It, all that has to be done is to is to cultivate a disposition like that of Mary. Let it be done to me according to your desire. Okay, so. It has to start with the notion that 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 I I can feel God calling me. I can feel the desire to have perfect peace. I can have I can feel the desire. Boy, I could I could weave this into the fallen angels at this point, but it would take another hour. We only have five more minutes, so I'm, I'm going to leave the holy angels alone for a minute. Um, We, we, we feel a desire, we, we hear the gospel, we hear the words of Christ, or we see something, I don't know, it could be anything that really could attract us to the spiritual life. We want to have this peace, we want to know how to pray, we want to know God, we want to be happy, we want to be without fear of death, we want to be, we want to be like the angels. So we feel that desire for this oneness with God. That's where it starts. Some people never get that. Some people go through their whole life in religion, never think they think this is something we do on Sunday. And I guess I believe in God and I've kind of checked the box, but I don't think about God. There are other people who think about God all the time. They're thinking, what is the purpose of my life? Where do, how what, who am I supposed to be? What is the true destiny of my life? People who think about that, they, that's God in them, awakening them to union with, with himself. And people who have that desire then ask themselves, like the rich young man, what must I do? And here's where most people go wrong. Most people get the answer from their minister or their rabbi or their priest. Oh, what you must do you must, you must, um, you must, re you must repent of all your sins, which I guess in a certain sense is true, but that's not really, really true. Um, and then you must do the following things: you must go to church on Sunday, you must keep the commandments, you must do all these. There's lots of do's and don'ts in order to get this thing. In the the truth is much simpler than that. The truth is. Tell God you want it to happen and make yourself available to God on a regular basis and talk to God. Yes. And God will show you your own life. You see, repentance of sins, I mean, repentance of sins is God making us aware of things that we have done that really we and ourselves wished we hadn't done. <laughs> And when he shows us the things that we wished we hadn't done, he also shows us that the one who wished she hadn't done them is the only one of me that he really knows. <laughs> so the repentance of sins is the acknowledgement of sins and the awareness that there is a deeper me loved by God who has nothing to do with those sins. And he has no more interest in those sins than I have at that point because he only has an interest in me. So, so if, I, if I show up regularly saying to God, let it be to me according to your word, according to your desire, let me be as you have created me to be. Help me know myself as you have created me to be. Help me to be open to you. Help me to be open to others. If I pray like that, I will become another Mother Teresa. She, many of the saints said they became holy 
the time, the day they let go of trying to achieve holiness. Holiness is not something we can do. It's something that God does in us by us. And this is God himself doing it in us, but it's us making ourselves available to God allows God to be glorified in us. The whole purpose of our creation is so that God can be glorified in us by us giving ourselves over to God so he can manifest his glory through the unique person he made me to be with the unique mission that he commissioned me to be, which is my personal vocation or my personal calling. And when I say my there, I mean each one of us. The most difficult thing is when we're in a personal relationship with a person and we do not know what God's will is for us, how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And um, it could be a family member or a friend or, or, or somebody. But you could look at it this way, you could look at it that way, and say, God, give me the answer. So I don't, I, I don't want to prolong this too much longer. And Rosemary, I want to know if that, if that helped with your, with your observation or not. There's no, in God's world, there is never any place for discouragement. There's only, only a place for gratitude and openness and expectation and joy. There, there, there is no darkness in the world of God. You cannot go wrong with God. You can only go wrong with yourself and with others when you when you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Gretchen's question was, and we got to finish with this because there are some who have to go. But the que the question is how 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 do you how do you relate to people when you're in a room with some somebody one when you don't know what God's will for them is? And the answer to that is we never know what God's will for another person is. So it's never my job to tell them one thing or another about who they are or what they should do. I should be so in touch with who I am in God and who God is in me that all I have to be for them is a welcoming presence in whose space they can begin to discover themselves and be, discover God as present to them because I'm cultivating that presence within myself. You should, you should be quiet with the quietness of presence. Amen. Presence is an, an alert awareness with it, which is without agenda. It's a space of pure welcoming. Just be there, be, but be there not with your ideas about how to make them better, not with there with your ideas about where they should go or what they should do. Be there as a listening presence. And in that, pre see that presence is the presence of God. Where two or three are gathered, there I am. He's referring to the mystery of presence. Now that person also is known to God. This is where we should have started today, right? Every person is known to God, but every person is not known to themselves. Every person before they are known by God, right? Before they before they know God, every person before they know God as presence, every person is 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 what's the word? Pretending. Before I meet God as presence, I am pretending. I'm a pretender. I'm not, I'm not really acting as who I am. I'm acting as who I want the world to believe I am. Amen. Or who I wanted my mother to believe I am, or who I want the world, what I wanted to say about me in my obituary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not at, see that the I am who I am is buried beneath all those layers of ego or of pretense. And everybody has those layers of ego and pretense. The whole world of darkness is built on pretense. This is what Christ came to save us from. And, and to do that, he had to scandalize us because he had to break through all those layers of pretense. And one of the hardest ones to break through is the pretense of religion. And so he demolished Judaism. He demolished family life. He demolished every realm of being that layers more ego upon people. 
and he poured out his spirit like a divine elixir to dissolve those layers of ego. Kathy, you could think of that water, you could think of that water and blood coming from his side as a divine solvent that's coming out upon the world and it's dissolving the structures of thinking and acting and behaving and politicking that have kept the world in slavery to the evil one ever since the beginning of humanity. And that new creation is beginning to emerge from that world of death and that culture of death. And it should be manifest in the church, but it's manifest any place where a person has acquired a sense of presence and has recognized presence as the power of God in this world. So I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm going to turn off the recording, I think, and then I'm going to... Uh...